Okay, so uh, as we wrap up here, um, a couple of quick things. So last vocab quiz is already posted and it closes on Wednesday, right? Again, like in terms of numerical value for your grade, it doesn't really matter. So just think of it as practice for the exam. Um, speaking of practice for the exam, you will see that I've given you a vocab sheet now um, to help you study. So what I would like everybody to do for Wednesday is just kind of go over this on your own and show up Wednesday afternoon with any questions you have about any of these terms or about the sample essay questions or about anything at all that we've discussed this semester, right? These review sessions usually go a little bit better, a little more smoothly if people show up with, uh, with some questions. Because I, I, can't, uh, I can't cover a whole semester's worth of material in 75 minutes. I can try, but it's gonna be real fast and it's not gonna be real good. The other thing I wanna remind everybody of too, like if there are particular texts that your memory of is a little fuzzy, Remember that we've got recordings of just about every um, everything we've read, or every lecture we've done so far on Georgia Views. You can always go back and check those as well. Um, the exceptions being the days when you guys were leading the class because yeah, I don't feel comfortable filming y'all. Because I imagine you don't feel comfortable being filmed. <laughs> so, uh, does anybody have any questions about anything? Uh, before we get, oh, um, last thing uh, before we get to questions. Uh, your proposals. Um, I will get to those tomorrow morning. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I see that they are there. They're in the folder. So, good on you. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll, I, I will get to those first thing tomorrow. Okay, now, any questions? Yes, Peyton. Are these the only probable ones that are going to show up? I know not all of them are going to be, but... It, yeah, the, the, the 15 that will be on the exam will be taken from this list. Okay. So yeah, I, I won't, I, well, yeah, I, I, I don't believe in uh, playing gotcha <laughs> with students. Um, so yeah, um, anything that I didn't put on this list, I won't uh, put in, in the vocab section. And the essay questions will all be um, thematically similar to the sample questions I gave you. They'll just ask you to reference specific texts. That will be the only difference. OK, any other questions? There will be two essay questions, right? Yeah, you're going to answer two essay questions this time. And the papers due that night after the exam, right? When, when do we have the, the exams? Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Is that the 7th? I think the 7th is the other one's due on the 7th. The, the papers oh, due okay. the 7th. Okay. The papers due the 7th. The papers, that's Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So you know what? I mean, again, it's like since, since there's only three of you and it doesn't impose, like, like this class doesn't impose an enormous grading burden on me, why don't we then make it due Thursday? So it'll actually be due the eighth. I do know our books are due December seventh, which is that. Well, we don't give a lot of grief to determine like. Oh, okay. <laughs> that <we're> <laughs> that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to be charged with money. Uh -huh. for that. <laughs> you know, the the, the 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 other thing you can do if you need to return your books, right? Um, if there are things like, what what you could do is ask me. You can ask me to make a PDF for you of the text that you need, and I will do that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's no problem. That way nobody gets in trouble with the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, uh, then let's get to the last little bit of new material that we have before we wrap up the course. Uh, so what y'all think of this? It seemed like, I don't know if my imagination just very wild, but it seemed like a t I was watching a TV show or maybe a movie, like reading it. Uh -huh. I was reading a script. Okay. 
um, especially when Nina was introduced, that devil interaction between her and the store. It uh -huh. just seemed like a script that was reading. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, so, so like this seemed almost like kind of like more visual right. than a lot of things that we've read. Yes. I also like how it kind of jumped point of views. Like yes. with the sequence of the uh -huh. events, it kind of jumped between each person and what they were going through. Okay, but yeah. That's I think that's what I kind of felt like, mm -hmm. how it felt like a TV show. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, yeah we moved. Jumping point of views. Yeah, I, 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 I think, yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a big part of what's happening thematically here is the moving from point of view to point, to, sometimes even within the same scene, right? right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's the scene in the shoe store, for example, where we get both um, Alsana's point of view and Nina's, right? You know, cause, you know, we're still there with Nina for a little bit after Alsana has left with right. the shoes. Um, and we get, you know, we get Saman's point of view as well. But like, do we notice that the point of view seems to stick with a particular group of people? Yeah, it seems to be almost entirely told from the point of view of the Bangladeshi immigrant characters, right? Yes. Um, the only perspective characters we get are, we get are Samad, Alsana, and Nina, right? These other characters, are pre Archie and Clara are present, Saul Josephowitz is present, right? Um, and they're important. Um, but we never see things from their point of view, right, through their eyes, right? It's, it's all from members of this family. And I'm not really sure what to do with that yet, but maybe we'll get some ideas by the time we get through this. Uh, so other thoughts you guys had about this, or other, um, <clears throat> I, think the, I think the point, yeah, the, the point of view thing is, I think, a really, a really good observation. There's also a battle between, like, liberal and traditional views towards the end between the Okay. Side and the yeah. And I think there's something else going on underneath that liberal versus traditional argument as well, right? Which person is giving us what we would regard as a more liberal perspective? Nina. Yeah, and how is Nina different from Alsana? They're actually, they're almost the same age, right? Even though Alsana is her aunt. Um, she talks about like abortion and mm -hmm. um, the disgrace of giving birth to men. <laughs> like bringing okay, more yeah. men into the world. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Nina speaks, yeah, from actually kind of like an explicitly second wave feminist position, mm -hmm. right? So if we think back to when we talked about um, Virginia Woolf and Doris Lessing, right? So yeah, and the, the, she's giving Clara these Clara Jones these books to read, right? All of which are again these classic second wave feminist texts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so she's definitely associated with second wave feminism. How else are Nina and Alsana different from each other? What, for example, in the way they talk? Isn't it, didn't it Alsana try to speak more English? Or she mentioned something about speaking English? Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like exactly, like specifically what it was. Uh huh. I think when she entered the store, mm -hmm. Nina, was speaking in the, 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 I guess the native language, the native tongue. Yeah, on page 1243, right? Yes. Alsana, you look like dog shit. You called over. <laughs> <laughs> what is that horrible coat? It's none of your business. It's none of your business. Is what it is," replied Alsana in English. "I came to collect my husband's shoes, not to chit chat with niece of shame." That's <laughs> the English. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, look like does it seem typical though of Nina to speak in Bengali rather than English? 
do her values seem more Western or more traditional Bengali Muslim? Like Western? Yeah, Nina is, yeah, Nina is much more assimilated, right? Mm -hmm. Right? She uses, you know, she uses English slang, even when she's speaking Bengali, right? You know, she says that Alsana looks like dog shit, right? Um, you know, when the, uh, the, per the, when her manager shouts for her to, you know, come, you know, work on these shoes, you know, she says, you know, keep your tits on, right? Which is a, a Britishism for, you know, the, like, you know, wait, right? <laughs> I'm coming. Um, but yeah, Alsana doesn't use Britishisms, and when she does, she tends to use them slightly incorrectly, right? You know, like, you know, uh, you know, she says, well, that, that is a load of the cod's wallop, right? Whereas a British person would simply say, a load of cod's wallop. So, Alsana's English is um, a much more kind of like immigrant English, right? And then you see throughout, especially when Nina is introduced, that she corrects Alsana a lot. Yeah. A lot of things that she says. She's like trying to be the more mature person. Uh huh. Yeah, in well meaning ways, right? But also sometimes a little condescending, right? I think she, she seems to sometimes think that Alsana is dumber than she actually is, right? <laughs> or less perceptive, at least, than she actually is, less worldly than she actually is. But yeah, and I think that yeah, these so Nina's liberal values are associated more with Englishness, right? She, you know, she she speaks English, she speaks British slang, she works outside the home in a shop, she's adopted these you know kind of Western European values, um, and um, you know she even her her clothes, you know she you know does everybody know like you've all seen like the Harry Potter movies, right? So when they talk about her wearing a college scarf, right, that's kind of like the, the different like house color scarves that all of the students at Hogwarts wear, right? Um, and it, it's something that like English secondary schools and universities do, right? So a college um, in Britain is either a secondary school or it's like a constituent unit of a university, right? So like if you go to Cambridge University, right, you won't be studying, like, people won't say that, oh, I'm, I'm a student at Cambridge. They'll say, like, oh, I'm at, um, like, I'm, I'm reading English at Jesus College or something like that, you know, it's, um, which is one of the constituent colleges of Cambridge, right, that, that does, like, I'm not just making up a name that does exist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, and, you know, there, there's a scarf that's associated with each college or with each university, right? So that's what she's wearing there. Now, what else do we know about how, like, because we get a lot more of Alsana than we do of Nina, right? Most of what we get of Nina is at the end in the park. Uh, what else do we know about Alsana? She's, like, more religious. I guess she talks about God a lot. Yeah. Um, although, like, what are, what are we told about her religion? What is the only part of her religion she's missing? The faith. <laughs> I have to talk about that. <laughs> Everything but actual belief, right? Yeah. So yeah, but it, it, it's kind of part of holding on to that identity, right? So in Al with Alsana, we have an immigrant who is holding on to a Bangladeshi identity in a different national context, right? Whereas Nina has adopted a British identity. So, <clears throat> what about Samad? Let's talk a little bit about Samad here as well, and where Samad fits into the picture of immigrant life in Britain that this gives us. He's like the idea of mistreatment in like the working world. Okay, how so? Um, I mean, they talk about his shoes and how they were, like, uh -huh. destroyed, and yeah. she's like, it's because he's always on his feet, and, um, he's kind of, 
yelled at by this one character, I can't remember his name. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then he asked for a raise, and his cousin, like before he even uh -huh. told him why, he just was already yeah. thinking no. Yeah, the, 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 this, this other artist here, right, his boss, mm -hmm. is his cousin, right, this guy's family. And he won't give him a raise, right? Let's actually, let's, let's look at that for a second, because I think that the way this is handled is kind of interesting here. Um, can I get somebody to start reading? Um, let's start at page 1241. Um, Top, there's a, one evening shortly after he put the down payment on the Wilsden flat. I'll read. Thank you, Riley. Okay. One evening shortly after he had put the down payment on the Wilsden flat, Simon had waited until everyone left and then climbed the loudly carpeted stairs to Artisher's office where he had something to ask him. Cousin, said Artisher with a friendly grimace <laughs> at the side of Simon's body, curling cautiously around the door. He knew that Simon had come to inquire about a pay increase. And one of his cousins should be at least considered the case of not his friendly judiciousness before he declined. Cousin, come in. Good evening, Artisher Mukal, said Samad, stepping fully into the room. Sit down, sit down, said Artisher warmly. No point standing on ceremony now, is there? Okay, let's pause here for a second, right? Because we notice a different in level a difference in levels of address here, right? What does Artisher call Samad? Cousin. Cousin, right? So What's he emphasizing in the way he addresses Samad? Their relationship. Yeah, the family relationship, right? Cousin, cousin, come in. And how does Samad address Ardashir? His full name. Yeah, his full name, right? Yeah. So very formal here, right? Addressing him as boss, right? Good evening, Artashir McCool. Right? <laughs> so, what's weird about this? I mean, we know Samad is about to ask for a raise, right? So who would we expect in this exchange to be trying to emphasize familiarity and closeness? I think the mod would try to uh -huh. decide that relationship, like, hey, you know, we're cousins, you should probably pay me more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're cousins. So, hey, right, hey, hey, fam, right? <laughs> <laughs> Help me out here, right? <laughs> but Samad puts it on a business footing, right? And Artashir puts it on the family footing. Why? Maybe he thinks he'll forgive him if he says no, he's like, well, we're so close. Uh-huh. And then um, yeah. he's trying to make it business because mm -hmm. he wants that raise and he's hoping like he will recognize that it's still business. Uh-huh. I think too, like if you start addressing people by like family relationships right off the bat, it makes it really awkward to segue into like a business sort of a deal if you're yeah. like, no, yeah. I feel like we have to go through all the pleasantries. Uh -huh. How's your family doing? Uh -huh. Oh, you're good, you're good. Maybe and, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> like, and, and who's taking advantage of who in this situation? Artishir's definitely taking advantage of this line. Yeah, Artishir, I mean, like, in a sense, he's helping Samad out by giving him a job when he couldn't get one in Britain, right? But he's also exploiting that need and that family connection, right? So, okay, because this guy's my cousin and he's desperate, I don't actually have to pay him very much. Samad was glad this was so. He said as much. He took a moment to look with the necessary admiration around the room with its relentless flashes of gold, its thick pile carpet, its furnishings in various shades of yellow and green. One had to admire Artisher's business sense. He had taken the simple idea of an Indian restaurant, small room, pink tablecloth, loud music, atrocious wallpaper, meals, and just made it bigger. He hadn't improved anything. It was the same old craft, but bigger in a bigger building in the biggest tourist trap in London, Leicester Square. You had to admire it and admire the man who now sat like a benign locust, 
His slender, insectile body swamped in a black leather chair, leaning over the desk, all smiles. A parasite disguised as a philanthropist. What do you think of that? It's like putting a light on his manipulation, and it's like animalizing him because of it. Okay, yeah, I, I like the, yeah, the, the animalizer. He's described like, and let, let's think about the specific animal here too, right? What do we know about locusts? What do locusts do? <laughs> they like eat everything and destroy crops. And... Yeah, locusts destroy crops and like eat everything in sight, right? This is why that swarm, you, you don't want a swarm of locusts descending on your field, right? Yeah, because they, they are, you know, as the text here says, they're, they're parasites. And Ardashir is one of these devourers, right? And if we look on the next page, as Samad is explaining his problems and asking for a raise, right? Can I get somebody to start uh, reading from, don't mistake me, Samad, we're both intelligent frank men. <laughs> Don't mistake me, Samal. We're both intelligent, great men, and I think I can speak frankly. I know you are not a fucking waiter, he whispered, and the expletive and smiled mm. indulgently after it, as if it were a naughty private thing that brought them closer together. I see your position. Of course I do, but you must understand mine. If I made allowances for every relative I employed, I'd be walking around like bloody Mr. Gandhi <laughs> without a pot to piss in, spinning my thread by the light of the moon. An example, at this very moment, that wastrel fat Elvis brother-in-law of mine, Hassan Ish... How do you say it? Uh, Hussein Ishmael. Ishmael, okay. The butcher. The butcher demands that I should raise the price I paid for his stinking meat. But Ardashir... We are brothers in, brothers in law, he says, he's saying to me, and I'm saying to him, but Muhammad, this is retail. Okay, so let, let's, let's look at here what Ardashir does actually very cleverly, right? Samad has come to him with a problem, right? I'm, you know, I'm trying to move and my wife is pregnant and I need a raise. And what does Ardashir then do? He's saying like, I also get. <laughs> <laughs> you know, about money, like, he's uh -huh. still getting money taken from him, so it's kind of, he's trying to equal them out on the idea that they both are treated unfairly by not getting Yeah, he just glosses over Samad's problem, mm -hmm. right? And starts bitching about his own. Yeah. It's like, oh, brother mm -hmm. I know, you, you think you got problems, right? right? It's interesting, though, too, the story he chose to share and how it was another family relationship, and he made that clear distinction. Yeah. Like, we're brothers in law, but this is retail. And, uh, like, made it very yeah. clear, like, <laughs> when we're dealing with something in this world, we're dealing with it as business people, not as family. And yeah. then when we're not uh, in this world, we're totally family. <laughs> he, and he's, like, recognizing, oh, you're not, I know you're not a waiter, because yeah. everyone defines him as a waiter. Uh -huh. And so he's kind of trying to put him on that personal level, and it's mm -hmm. like that, like you said, makes him uncomfortable. Yeah, it's like that. Like, I know you're better than this, mm -hmm. but what am I going to do, right? <laughs> Got you over a barrel, cuz. <laughs> and <clears throat> if, we, like, if we look at the restaurant as well as like, kind of like an expression of uh, kind of South Asian cultural identity, what do we notice about the restaurant itself? Like when we get these situations in the restaurant. For one thing, what do we notice about all, basically all the people who work there? They don't like working there. Okay, no, no, no one seems to like working there. Why, why do most of them work there? And this isn't explicitly stated, but you can... Um, kind of infer it. I mean, it seems like most of them are either family or friends somehow, kind of. Yeah, related. they're all, yeah, they're all related. 
except for one person, right? There's one person who is not related to the others. Is it Shiva? Yeah, Shiva, the only good waiter in the place, right? The, the only guy who actually gets good tips. And he complains the most. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, when they take his tips, they <laughs> really get it. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's about, like like Shiva also like in addition to like being the one who makes the most money because he's younger and better looking than the others, right? He's also like he also ha again like has the least in common with them, right? He's not a member of the family, and he's the only Hindu. The others are Muslims, so he doesn't feel the same kind of sense of common um, purpose. With the others who pull the t who pull their tips, right? Now, one could also say that this means that kind of like like Nina, Shiva has internalized a more capitalist ethic, or a more Western ethic, right? A more Western approach to money than anyone else in the restaurant, except for maybe artists here, right? Who likes the tip system because it means he doesn't have to pay people as much. But what else do we notice about like what about the restaurant's clientele? They like never know how to pronounce any of the uh -huh. stuff, so it's probably <laughs> not anyone like from the same ethnic group that comes there. It's probably people who are like, oh, I want to try this type of food, yeah. and then they say everything wrong. Yeah, which we're told the restaurant's a tourist trap, right? And what? And like if we look at the way they order too, like um, on page 1239, right? Go buy LO SAG, please. Chicken gel fretzi with chips, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, like, what, do they, what do they want with what do they want with their Indian food? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're always asking for things with a sack of fries. <laughs> now, like a, to, a like a takeaway curry with a side of chips, like that is actually a really popular, like kind of like late night British takeout food. Like after after you've got a good drunk on, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, like like the, you know, you can go to the curry shop and you get a little tin. With you know maybe some chicken curry or some beef curry in it, and a side of chips, and you take it home, and maybe it soaks up some of the booze in your stomach, right? <laughs> but yeah, so that they're actually they're they're ordering something that is a very kind of British spin on Indian food, right? So what these customers are ordering is something that is kind of hybridized. I think one thing that we need to kind of pay attention to in this story generally is um, its approach to cultural hybridity. So Zadie Smith um, is a biracial British woman, uh, English father, uh, Jamaican mother, I think. And um, she writes frequently about what she calls the dream city. And for Smith, this dream city is a kind of, it's a kind of safe space for multiracial and multicultural identities. And the Iqbals um, kind of move from a space that is clearly not this to something that is more like Smith's idea of the um, kind of like hybrid dream city, right? So the neighborhood they start out in, uh, Whitechapel. Have any of you ever heard of Whitechapel before? Maybe in a different context? 
number. <laughs> okay. So if you have heard of Whitechapel before, it is a London neighborhood that around the end of the 19th century was the location of the Jack the Ripper murders. Now, by the 1970s, um, Whitechapel was pretty much um, a South Asian neighborhood. Right? The vast majority of the residents were South Asian, which meant it was also often a target for racist violence. Um, you may have noticed references to National Front. Groups um, in the story here. And I think we mentioned the National Front a little bit uh, before the break. Um, does anybody know who they are or what they are or were? Was it like a, a white nationalist political party? Yeah, yeah. So the, the National Front were uh, basically uh, British neo Nazis. Um, far right, white supremacist, mostly working class mostly youth, um, a lot of skinheads. Um, they typically wore like big, heavy uh, Doc Martens or other kind of steel cap boots. And yeah, they were noted, particularly in the 70s, for acts of um, racist violence in Asian neighborhoods and in African immigrant neighborhoods as well, Caribbean immigrant neighborhoods. And they were motivated in part by sentiments that had been expressed in the 60s by a politician named Enoch Powell. So Powell was um, a minister in a conservative party government um, who on April 20th, 1968, Birmingham gave what has come to be known as the Rivers of Blood speech. He doesn't actually say these words in the speech, but it's um, he quotes some lines from uh, Virgil's epic poem, The Aeneid, about the river Tiber that runs through Rome, um, you know, foaming with blood. So Powell uh, <clears throat> claimed to be speaking on behalf of some constituents who had written to him, um, including um, a white woman in Wolverhampton uh, who had refused to rent out uh, rooms in her house uh, to black tenants and was being penalized for it by the local county council. Um, and uh, a man who claimed that um, immigrants in his community were taking all the factory jobs, right? So we see here actually in Powell's speech elements of that kind of like white replacement theory that we see elements of the far right today. Uh, making arguments for, right? And Powell argued that the government should essentially pay to repatriate immigrants, right? To send um, immigrants back to whatever, whatever their countries of origin were. Um, but this had been complicated by that British Nationality Act of 1948, which declared what? Anybody remember? that the citizenship was the same for anyone in the colonies and for those who were born in Britain. Yeah. And so they could be there legally. Yeah. <laughs> they were British citizens. Yeah. Um, and Powell argued also that by the year 2000, one in 10 Britons would be non-white. Now this is actually a little bit of statistical sleight of hand here. Um, if you, if you say one in 10, right? If you change that to a percentage, what does that work out to? 10%. 10%, right? And what does percent literally mean? Per 100. Per 100, right? So 10 people 
per 100 versus 1 out of 10. Which sounds like more people? <laughs> yeah, if it's 1 out of every 10, right, rather than 10 out of every 100, right? This is actually a kind of classic scaremonger rhetorical tactic, right? You fudge the number. You, he's not lying here, but he's fudging the number a little bit in order to make it sound like more people than it really is. Right? One in ten, why that could be someone closer to you, right? As opposed to ten in one hundred, where it's okay, that could be people in your city or your neighborhood, right? But it doesn't feel quite as close to home. And he actually turned out to be right about this. The non-white population of Britain is now, I think, like by the year 2000, ends up being about 11 or 12 percent, right? Which also means that, you know, the white population of Britain is about 88 percent. So it's still a pretty overwhelming, even though it is a less white country than it was, it is still an overwhelmingly white country, right? But part of the idea of this speech is to stoke fear, to stoke anxiety. Particularly in a time of economic uncertainty, right? When Britain as an empire is essentially falling apart, right? So throughout the 20th century, there is a kind of decolonization process that happens um, across British territories. So in the 1920s and 30s, Several British colonial possessions become what are called dominions, which basically means that they're, they're self-governing entities that um, nonetheless like respect the British monarch as head of state, right? So these included Canada, the Irish Free State, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. The 1940s, right, 1947 specifically, you have the partition of India, and the creation of the new nations of India and Pakistan. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, you have the uh, not often smooth, sometimes violent uh, decolonization of Africa. And it's really not until the 19 the 1970s that we get decolonization of the Caribbean. Do we notice any, any um, anything about the way this progresses here? about who gets their independence from the motherland first and who gets it last. It's like racial, like, in pretty much. <laughs> yeah, countries that are predominantly white or that are at least run by white people, in the case of South Africa, get their independence first. And then nations that are <clears throat> black or brown predominantly, have to wait longer, right? And often kind of have to claim it for themselves rather than. Uh, but although, although there was, a, you know, there was actually um, a uh, an Anglo-Irish war in the early 1920s, uh, you know, between Irish militants and the British state. So that was, you know, there was violent conflict there. But and so this is the backdrop um, to what the Iqbals are experiencing as they come to live in London. So they move from Whitechapel 
right, this strictly immigrant neighborhood that is often subject to racist violence to a neighborhood called Wilsden. which is mixed, right? So um, if we look at the description of the neighborhood as Alsana is walking through it on page 1243, right? Now she was pregnant, uh, but all the same she reflected, slamming the door behind her. It was a nice area. She couldn't deny it as she stormed towards the high street, avoiding pavement trees where previously in Whitechapel, she had avoided flung out mattresses and the homeless. It would be good for the child. Alsana had a deep-seated belief that living near green spaces was morally beneficial to the young. And there to her right was Gladstone Park, a sweeping horizon of green named after the liberal prime minister. Alsana was from a respected old Bengal family and had read her English history. Note here, how among upper class Indians, knowledge of English and English history is a status marker, right? And in the liberal tradition, it was a park without fences, unlike the more affluent Queens Park, Victoria's, with its pointed metal railings. Wilsden was not as pretty as Queens Park, but it was a nice area, no denying it. No National Front kids breaking the basement windows with their steel cap boots like in Whitechapel. Now she was pregnant, she needed a little bit of peace and quiet. Though it was the same here in a way, they all looked at her strangely, this tiny Indian woman stalking the high street in a Macintosh, her plentiful hair flying every which way. Molly's kebabs, Mr. Chung's, Raj's, Malkovich bakeries. She read the new unfamiliar signs as she passed. She was shrewd. She saw what this was. Liberal, hush hush nonsense. No one was more liberal than anyone else anywhere anyway. It was only that here, in Wilsden, there wasn't enough of any one thing to gang up against any other thing and send it running to the cellars while windows were smashed. So the thing I really want to lean in here is like that last pair of sentences, right? What's different about Wilsden as a neighborhood, as the, in terms of the composition of the neighborhood, or at least how does Alsana see it? more ethnically diverse. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we are getting a neighborhood that's more ethnically diverse, right? And we can see that in the shop names, right? I mean, you've got Indian, Chinese, Eastern European, right? Uh, North African. But what's Alsana's response to the ethnic diversity of Wilson? Or how does she view it? Like there's no one to put them in place. It's like liberal, is what she's saying. Well, why? What does she think makes it liberal? That no group has a majority of like the people there. Yeah, there is no dominant group here, right? There's a little smattering of everything, and so nobody has the numbers to lord it over anyone else, right? So what does that show Alsana kind of assumes about human nature? If, say, there were more, um, let's say more, you know, more Chinese in Wills than anyone else, how does Alsana think they would behave? That they would be the oppressors to everyone else. That they'd push everyone around, right? So she seems to assume that whatever group is dominant in an area, right, at least in terms of numbers, is going to push everybody else around. That that's just kind of the way it's going to be. So do y'all remember this word from earlier in the semester? Um, yeah, it says being aware of one's own um, otherness. Yeah, it's being aware of one's status as other, right? And in Wilsden, who is the other? Alsana is the other visit. She looks she uh -huh. an Indian woman that walked around, pregnant. Um, 
Yeah, and we're so getting he's tiny and mini woman. Yeah, and we're getting her perspective, right? So she's here very conscious of her otherness in the neighborhood, right? But is she the only other in this neighborhood? No. Who else is an other? Everyone else. Everybody in this neighborhood. Others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's a yeah, so this neighborhood is kind of built around alterity, right? Um <clears throat> There's an idea that comes, that it's, that there's a term that's first coined uh, by the sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois in 1903 in a book called The Souls of Black Folk. And Du Bois is talking, because he's speaking from a kind of American context. But what he's talking about is something kind of similar to this idea of alterity. Um, he calls it double consciousness. Is this a word that any of you have run across in other classes? Yes. Yes? <laughs> but I, to be honest, I don't really remember. Okay. All right. Kostler's class? Okay, yep. <laughs> Yeah. I, I swear like we don't we don't share notes like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the time period. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, what, yeah. What's Pardon? the last word? Uh, sorry, oh. in the tone. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Sorry, yeah, right. I was thinking smudged. Yeah, this, <laughs> Thank the, you. The, this marker is starting to die. So for Du Bois, double consciousness is the internal conflict. that's experienced by members of subordinate groups in a society. So on the one hand, you can't help measuring yourself by the standards of the dominant but you're also conscious that in the eyes of that dominant group, you will never measure up, no matter what you try to do. Right? Because they're the ones who set the standard that can always move the goalposts. And in terms of the, ways, the way writers respond to this, there are basically two strategies that immigrant writers in particular tend to take um, in regards to, like in order to kind of deal with this double consciousness, right? The first is called abrogation. Abrogation is a refusal to write in conformity with the dominant group's language or aesthetic standards, right? So a writer who abrogates say, British culture, decides instead to write either in um, their native language, which typically has the effect of um, limiting their audience. Um, in particular, there's, a write, there's an African writer, he's uh, from Kenya, uh, by the name of Gugi Watongo. He's the best known living Kenyan novelist. Um, and up until the late 70s, he wrote in English. Um, but now he writes only in his native language of Kikuyu. Um, so, you know, his novels are regularly translated into English, but, you know, he decided that he would no longer write in what he regarded as an oppressor's language. Um, we can actually kind of see something similar in some of the poems 
that Cayley presented to us last time. Right, you know, the uh, Linton Quasi Johnson poem, for example, which is written in, and uh, the Louise Bennett poems as well, which are written in uh, West Indian, uh, <clears throat> like West Indian English, right? Rather than, you know, quote unquote, the Queen's English. The other strategy that you will often see writers taking, you tend to see this occur more frequently for some reason with South Asian writers. Um, African writers and Caribbean writers often seem to prefer the first strategy, but South Asian writers tend to prefer the second, but adaptation. And in this particular mode, what you do is you take the colonizers or the oppressors' language and kind of recolonize it yourself, right? You adapt it to express ideas that are counter to the values of the dominant group in society. Whether this means writing in British English or writing in a kind of hybrid form, like for example, um, the novelist, uh, the Indian novelist Salman Rushdie, uh, writes in a pretty clear, comprehensible English, but he mixes it with a lot of Indian words and often tries to mimic the speech patterns of an Indian person speaking English. And yeah, this is typically done to kind of undermine the cultural, you know, the cultural sense of superiority of the dominant group, right? So this is, these are two ways in which writers try to deal with the idea of double consciousness. Now, which of these do you think uh, is more relevant to the Zadie Smith story? Okay, yeah, I mean, this is written in fairly clear contemporary English, right? And it deals with the struggles immigrant characters have fitting into British society and their awareness of you know, how that dominant culture looks at them, right? And fails to make a place for them. But I think there's one part of this that I do kind of want to stop and zero in on for a moment that we haven't really discussed yet. It's when the three women are sitting in the park and they're having this conversation about you know, a fairly hot button issue, right? They're talking about abortion. And the park keeper by the name of Saul Josephowitz, or Josephowitz. Shows up. Can I get somebody um, to start reading on page 1247? from Good Afternoon, Nina, Good Afternoon, Mrs. Jones, near the bottom of the page. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kim. says, Good Afternoon, Nina, Good Afternoon, Mrs. Jones, says Saul, offering a neat bow to each. Are you sure you're all right, Mrs. Jones? Clara cannot stop the tears from squeezing out of the corners of her eyes. She cannot work out at this moment whether she is crying or laughing. The two states suddenly seem only a stone's throw from each other. I'm fine, fine. Sorry to have worried you, Mr. Josephowitz. Uh, really, I'm fine. I do not see what's so very funny, funny, mutters Alsana. The murder of innocence. Is, that, uh, is this funny? Not in my experience, Mrs. Iqbal. No, says Sol Josephowitz at the, uh, in the collective manner in which he says everything, passing his handkerchief to Clara. 
It strikes all three women the way history will, embarrassingly, without warning, like a blush, what the park keeper's experience might have been. They fall silent. Okay, so let's let's stop here, right? Now, when Saul Josephowitz says this, is he still talking about abortion? Is he even aware of what they're talking about? No, he isn't aware. So what is he talking about when he mentions the murder of innocence? He's talking more... Think about what... I, what oh, go I, ahead, sorry. Okay, from what I gathered, uh -huh. I think he's talking more about um, World War II, maybe Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at his name. Yeah, the name Saul Josephowitz indicates what about his ethnicity? That he may be Jewish? Yeah. Eastern European Jewish. Yes. Yeah. So when he mentions the murder of innocence, what he's referring to is, yeah, it's the Holocaust. And why do you think this makes them all fall silent? all three women the way history will. Embarrassingly, without warning, like a blush, what the park keeper's experience might have been, they fall silent. Maybe they feel like they're selfish and not considering like, the life, I guess the life of Yeah, they're, they're, you know, kind of like talking about this issue in the abstract, right? Oh, is it like internal conflicts? Like they're not considering the external conflicts, they're only thinking about the internal conflicts. Okay. I think it's something like that, yeah, yeah. That, um, and yeah, essentially what, like, what this guy is doing is he's coming and, you know, making, like, showing up with this concrete historical experience, right, of suffering. And his kind of silent, reserved demeanor in the face of all this just kind of smacks them all in the head, right? That everybody bears suffering in some sense, right? And Saul Josephowitz's suffering is probably pretty profound. think that part of what's going on here is that in this right, this dream city, you know, right, when Alsana was just thinking about diversity as the fact that there's no one group that's big enough to push everybody else around, right? I think the way you like the way this actual ideal hybrid city comes about, this ideal hybrid culture comes about, maybe is through acknowledgement of and respect for other people's pain and other people's suffering. Right? Not just keeping a respectful distance. Because that would just until you know the seven great equal thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everyone's in the same city, but you know, you're over there, we're over here, and you're still clipped off. Yeah, you, you, you might have, you know, Molly Kebabs and Mr. Chung's and Raj's and right. Malkovich Bakeries all next to each other on the same street, right. but if there's no meaningful interaction between them, right, right then you're still, they're still just little enclaves. I think also it was kind of interesting to see that interaction after we saw the one between Samad and his cousins. Uh, uh, Ardashir. Ardashir. Ardashir Mukul, yes. yes. About like seeing how they were, you know, Samad was coming to him with the problem. Uh -huh. um, basically, yeah. he 
downplay Samad's problem uh -huh. by so bringing his own. Yeah, let me tell you about my problem. Right. So long, right? And <laughs> then, <laughs> yeah, to like vocalize his like constant stresses with them, with them. You know, they're complaining about their yeah. problem. Yeah. But then Saul doesn't even have to say anything. They just yeah. like, you know, and like their silence. Yeah, and I think if we compare the two episodes, right, right. there's in Artisher's case, there's a failure of sympathy, right? right? Even with someone who's like him. Whereas in the case of the women, right, I think that the difference here is a, you know, a, a genuine feeling of you know, sympathy with Saul Josephowitz, right? You know, that they're all kind of instantly shamed and chagrined, right? right. And I think that that like you know like the end I think the end of the story is ultimately kind of hopeful with Clara waving the handkerchief right. you know, like a banner as and he's like crossing the border of the country and that's like what they want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's a story about immigrants. Yeah, and it's, so maybe the crossing the border is a little on the nose, but yeah. <laughs> Alright, so we are about out of time. Um, and yeah, like I said, like this is the last new material you will have to absorb in this course. <laughs> um, and yeah, we'll see you all on Wednesday. And I, I, I do just, again, just how much I have, I have enjoyed having the three of you in this class.